We need more energy from all sources. Whoa. Some ice water. Kaboom. Safely develop oil and natural gas right here by expanding access onshore and off. Do not let the fossil fools of corpocracy dictate to you or your neighbor that fracking is safe. Tapping more than a century's worth of domestic natural gas and developing Canadian oil sands for U.S. consumers. Benzene is linked to breast cancer, according to the Institute of Medicine. All that could put a million more Americans to work. These are literally our life support systems. I mean, who would rather drink uncontaminated water or poison? Oil and gas drilling is coming to El Paso County and possibly Colorado Springs. We're talking hydraulic fracturing or fracking today and in the loop. New technologies are safely unlocking vast domestic supplies of oil and natural gas, like energy from shale. It's a process, also known as hydraulic fracturing, that involves injecting massive amounts of water, sand, and a toxic cocktail of chemicals deep underground using extreme pressure. That pressure creates cracks in the rock bed, releasing the gas. We're sitting on a bunch of shale gas. There's natural gas under my town. It's a game changer. It means cleaner, cheaper, American-made energy. Watersheds across the nation have been contaminated with plastics, carcinogens, neurotoxins, and endocrine-disrupting chemicals, and with explosive natural gas. Whoa. It causes massive land scarring, air pollution, a public health crisis, truck traffic, miles and miles of pipelines, blowouts, spills, accidents. That's, that's everybody's concern is that we're going to crack this rock and somehow fracture into the water table and then allow those two to communicate. That's physically impossible to do, actually. Colorado's own Laramie Fox Hills Aquifer was officially documented as contaminated August 1st, 2009 by thermogenic gas, which is created from fracking, and toluene, a chemical, a fracking chemical. They want to do that here in Colorado Springs. I just could not believe that you would even think about doing this within the city limits. Drilling and fracking in residential zones in the city. Oh, wow. So a lot of the emotion and the argument that's brought up just isn't borne out by the data when you go actually get on the ground and look at it. The state was protecting or hiding their data from the public, and it shocked the hell out of me I was sitting there with a couple million official documents in my hand saying, this is all wrong. Everything about this in Colorado is wrong, and it's absolutely harmful to us and the environment. I don't believe that uh, there's been enough uh, uh, science to show that it's, that it's dangerous. In France, fracking has been banned. In Quebec and New Jersey, there are moratoriums in place thousands of jobs. Use the most advanced technology to protect our water. Billions in the economy. In northeastern Ohio, work was suspended this week at five wells used to dispose of wastewater from oil and gas drilling. The suspension follows a dozen minor earthquakes in that area since last spring. I was absolutely shocked and astounded when I started learning what has happened in Pennsylvania, parts of New York, in our own state our own state and how many people's lives have been ruined their homes their livestock their crops the air the water drill baby drill that's the song we sing drill baby drill that inch right there this is cement and what you don't want is for that cement to fail mm -hmm. or to be absent to crack to corrode, to crumble, to disappear, if what's down there can get into this annulus, right. then it can migrate. So, is this the answer to our energy woes or a risky, untested science? President Obama this week pushed for expanding natural gas production as a way to fuel economic growth. And with smart policies, we can create even more great jobs and could generate billions to fund schools, roads, and other services. The vast majority of people here think it's wonderful. 
They think there'll be jobs. They think they'll be able to keep their families here. They'll be able to pay for education. Um, but we find that all is good on paper, but when things happen that ruin the value of your property, ruin the health of your family, and it, that all goes out the window. This reminds me of like gold boom town in the 1800s. <laughs> There's a lot of work in this region. They're making really good money. If you were walking down the street and you saw money laying in the street, you would pick it up and say, man, this is my lucky day. Well, here in El Paso County, we have this treasure laying at our feet. All we have to do is pick it up. So let's say that they discover there's something wrong with the water. What, I mean, do they bond up for that in the application? Or how, do we, uh, how are we assured that there'll be money to pay for any remediation? You know, I don't know that I have an answer to that. Let me look here real quick on the, the summary that I have. The guys come to come in here and say, hey, we're going to put a guide well back here on your place. We didn't much care for it at the time, but it ended up where it sure did pay off and pay out. We're going to make a lot of money, and we're going to spend it. It's an absolute economic boom. How, how often do you get big checks in the mailbox like Every that? Every month. Every month. Every month. So are you standing out by the mailbox? Well, <laughs> yeah. I wonder how many comments this one's going to have. And we call it mailbox money. In Colorado, most of the West, the people that own the mineral rights underground are not the same people that own the surface. The person who owns those minerals has the right to get them out in the least disruptive way they can. Our results indicate that in 2011, the total monetary damages from conventional air pollution emissions from Pennsylvania-based shale gas extraction activities ranged from about 7.2 to $32 million. Huge economic boost. It's, I don't see why we, we don't do it more often. Yes, the money is the one really good thing. The rest of it pretty much sucks, working really long hours. In my case, I was living in my car. This is a huge opportunity for Ohio. Why would we want not capitalize on all that and put all these folks to work and have all this economic investment? $900 million by Chesapeake, $500 million by Mark West, and so many others. I guarantee you that any money that the city earns from these activities will be negated in the future and spent in the future for cleanup, mitigation, and long-term effects of fracking. If tourists will not come here because we have highly polluted air and contaminated water, then the city's major source of revenue is gone. I think our state has roughly 675,000 people. You know, they think the state of North Dakota could grow to over a million people. And a lot of those new jobs will be in the oil and gas industry. When somebody gives you a jobs figure and says this will bring X number of jobs to your location, how many of those jobs are transient jobs? How many of those jobs are workers being brought in from out of state? It's a success story he's working hard to protect by adhering to strict safety and environmental guidelines, by making sure the oil and natural gas wells are encased in multiple layers of steel and cement. Now, for a long time, we believed what the developers were telling us, that drilling muds are benign, that they are safe, until we got an urgent request to see if we had any information about 40 products used in Wyoming during drilling. Today's technology allows us to tap these resources and protect the environment. The last time this program was updated for Colorado alone, there were 246 products and 278 chemicals on our list. 93% of the 246 products had identifiable health effects. Fracking chemicals are linked to bone, liver, and breast cancers, gastrointestinal, circulatory, respiratory, developmental, as well as brain and nervous system disorders. And they are in frac waste and may find their way into drinking water and air. And it gets worse. Today, waste from Pennsylvania gas wells, waste that may also contain unacceptable levels of radium, is routinely dumped across state lines into landfills in New York, Ohio, and West Virginia. 43% of the products on our list contain endocrine disruptors, chemicals that can interfere with the development of individuals before they are born and cause irreversible lifetime changes in their health and how they function later in life. The first one was done by Lisa McKenzie, the Colorado School of Public Health, and what it shows is that people living near wells have higher cancer rates. 66% was the increased likelihood of cancer. That's at a half a mile. That's over 2,000 feet. 
how far is far enough? And for many of you, I think no drilling is only as, is as far as you want to go and will only accept that. The estimate of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Preservation is one serious environmental concern for every 150 wells drilled to date. There have been more people killed by cantaloupes, tainted cantaloupes in Colorado in the past year than by oil and gas in the past 60. There's no documented deaths in that area. There's no documented uh, of the uh, groundwater. I know there's been miscarriages here that, that live with gas wells like right across the street. There's been a mother that had a miscarriage and a, a year later had a baby and while she was breastfeeding it, two months old, it died. And then another miscarriage in that same family that lives around these wells. So it's pretty obvious that something's wrong. These are young, healthy girls that are just having miscarriages and losing babies. This is a case January 13, 2011 in Florence, Colorado. The Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission requested emergency funding for explosive levels of methane seeping into occupied residential homes from plugged and abandoned wells. Almost every house, at least every other house, has probably had someone with cancer or someone in their family with major birth defects. At least the job that I was in, you're dealing with a lot of chemicals, you're breathing a ton of exhaust. Um, I'm still suffering right now. I was at the doctor today with bronchitis. Uh, I've already been through one course of antibiotics that didn't work. You know, a lot of people around here, uh, quite frankly, have a pro-industry view and, and wanted the gas to be extracted. But things changed pretty rapidly. We, it didn't take long to notice uh, significant impacts to the water. The change to smell like diesel fuel, methane was bubbling in the water. Uh, we had neighbors that actually had livestock die from drinking the water. The gas industry says it's safe. Here's what our neighbors in Pennsylvania say who have been living with fracking since 2004. We were doing just fine until this drilling started and then all of a sudden we're getting contaminants in our water and we find it's not safe to drink. If it was safe then people wouldn't get sick and animals wouldn't die from drinking the water. We got our air reports back yesterday, found that there are seven chemicals that are over the legal limit. I've had inflammation of the cornea and chemical burns to my eyes. My children have had nosebleeds and blisters in their mouths. The gas is going to be gone and we're still going to have dirty water and dirty air. There's no money or anything worth trading your drinking water for. When we first moved here, it was heaven on earth. Now it's hell on earth. You have clean air and water, preserve that, preserve that with your life. Due to the snow, poor snowpack levels we received last year in the hot drier year we had in 2012, you know, if we don't really receive above average snowfall, uh, we will be looking at some sort of, you know, watering restrictions for 2013. Each of these wells destroys five million gallons of water. We expect really no impact uh, to our Colorado Springs drinking water supplies. We're going to be seeing trillions of liters, tens of trillions of liters of British Columbia's fresh water forced into the ground with toxins all under the auspices of it's a clean transition fuel. And of course, we're now getting evidence that it's not clean, it's actually dirtier than coal. The amount of water that needs to be injected down hole is phenomenal. So where does that water come from? And once it's down there, Somewhere between 20 to 40 uh, percent of it will have to be, uh, will come back up to surface and will have to be disposed of. Uh, at this point, I don't think you can really call it water anymore. It's really a toxic soup. So we have purposely polluted large quantities of fresh water with chemicals that do not belong in the human environment. And now we have the responsibility, the industry and the landowners have a responsibility to dispose of them properly. Our neighbors, Pennsylvania and West Virginia, uh, and apparently New York find it uh, economical to ship the fracking waste from their states all the way to Ohio to get rid of it. Why? Mike Chatsy, I'll, I'll let you start. Well, gee, thanks. Um... <laughs> what they've been doing is putting these, this water in these class two wells under the supposition that it would stay down there forever. But what they think will stay in the earth will move eventually. What the geologists are now telling them, even the EPA scientists who permitted these wells, that all of them will leak eventually. I have seen what it does to cornfields. I've seen what it does to land that you can never you know, put animals on. You can never raise agriculture on again.
Tests analyzed by the federal EPA found Sautner's water contains toxic levels of arsenic, barium, manganese, and glycol compounds known to be common in drilling fluids. The cause, fracking by the Cabot Oil and Gas Company. Back in 2004, there was a, a major uh, explosion basically that happened on a, on a well pad that led to cementing failure on a couple of other wells that were underway. That led to a, a huge fracking incident where uh, the, uh, the well actually extended far beyond uh, fracking <coughs> models and blew out and contaminated it, the shallow aquifer of West Divide Creek with benzene and toluene and xylene and all the, all the constituents that come along with raw natural gas. In fact, they estimated about 115 million cubic feet uh, went into the, uh, the, uh, the environment, both terrestrial and aquatic, and we had a major exodus of wildlife. So I can tell you I've met hundreds of people in this province who have signed confidentiality agreements once their water was blown, once their livestock was killed, once a member of their family were injured. It is common practice in this province to buy people out and then buy their silence. They'll test the water after it's been contaminated so they can supply you with jugs of water for the rest of your life. Fracking to some extent in vertical wells was, was done over that time period, but not this horizontal fracking and not with high volumes of water. So we don't have the scientific investigation of this particular technology. There have been no documented incidences of water contamination from the hydrofracking process. One of the things the industry would have you believe is that fluid migration is rare. That when they put in these multi layers of, of cement and, and steel, fluids shouldn't move, especially the hydrocarbons that are in the formation. It's just not true. We, we looked at Canadian research. They found 12% of brand new wells have some kind of leak. I mentioned this work by EPA in Pavilion, Wyoming, where they found benzene, tylene, 2-butyl ethanol uh, in the groundwater from fracking fluids. And then I look closer at home here at Colorado Oil and Gas, and the, indeed some 36% of these wells have fluid flow right up past the, the top pipe. So well construction, if there is a, a breach in the well, then you might have some problems. There have been a few instances where that's been the issue. Findings by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection Back up findings in oil field review stating that casing failures exist in 6% of, of whales immediately upon drilling. Over a 30-year period, over 50% of those whale casings fail, and this is just one part of the system. Naturally occurring methane gas often ends up in water wells, but there has not been a single proven instance where it has been related to hydraulic fracking. Their post-fracking test, their own, the methane tested 0.01, milligrams per liter and since July of um, 2010 it has tested as high as 64 milligrams. Increased levels of methane gas in water supplies have been reported in areas of intensive drilling. This is the water that's in my well and supposedly I'm supposed to be drinking it. The gas industry that is saying the, that according to Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, Mike Markham's methane was biogenic or shallow gas. Uh, what's called biogenic methane is naturally occurring biogenic methane. So because it wasn't the gas they were drilling for, it wasn't their fault. Deeper gas, the gas that they frack for, is for the most part thermogenic. But as it turns out, the whole argument is misleading. Because even though the gas company wasn't drilling for biogenic gas, the drilling process could have caused biogenic gas to leak up into the aquifer. As you see here from this Lumberger article, pockets of shallow gas can find a way to escape up failed casings into aquifers. We would take a glass of water out of the tap and it would have like an oil base on the top. You could smell it. It would smell like diesel fuel it found or some it. kind of oil thing. It's just like the tobacco industry had memos in their drawers that said all along that they knew that nicotine was addictive and tobacco was harmful. The gas industry has memos in their drawers. We have some of them. Some of them, in fact, have been published. Others fell off the back of a truck, but here they are. And they'll show you how they've been trying to solve it for decades and how they have no way of completely fixing or preventing the problem. Number one, from Southwestern Energy, the diagram clearly shows that the gas well has a cement barrier around the sides of it that prevents gas from lower layers migrating upwards into aquifers. This isn't a PowerPoint about drilling wells. 
This is a PowerPoint about how casings fail and allow gas and other substances to migrate into aquifers. It's one of their own documents about how cement fails. Number two comes from Schlumberger, oil field review published in 2003 that showed that sustained casing pressure, i.e. casing failure, occurs at alarming rates. Their own documents showed that well casings failed in 6% of wells drilled immediately upon drilling and that those well casings deteriorated over time. That over a 30 year period, 50% of well casings failed. If the local governmental designee said, gee whiz, we want you to make the operator drill a monitoring well somewhere, we're not going to do that. I'll just tell you that we don't think the cost benefit works to require dedicated monitoring wells. Hi, this is Governor John Hickenlooper. In 2008, Colorado passed tough oil and gas rules. Since then, we have not had one instance of groundwater contamination associated with drilling and hydraulic fracturing. There has been no confirmed case of groundwater contamination tied to hydraulic fracturing. Is that really? Yes. Wait. Yes. I studied 1,000 spill release reports uh, done and operated by the COGCC in regards to oil and gas. So 1,000 oil and gas spills I studied. And what I concluded was that 42.7% of those appear to result in groundwater contamination. If I'm hydraulic fracturing Correct. and I spill the, fluid, the hydraulic fluid on the, on the, on the surface, that, that's never happened and that's never gotten into that's groundwater? That's not the hydraulic fracturing process. We all cannot deny the fact that we depend upon fresh water to survive, to exist, to grow our food, to, you know, to, to live. I think our water is more precious than our oil. Once the fracking stops, the flaring begins, a process where toxic chemicals are released through stacks. There was a potentially fatal release of sour gas uh, near the community of Puskupe in northeast BC. The cause of, of that gas leak uh, was definitively linked to a buildup of sand from the fracking process in the well, which caused the well piping to corrode and break. This was a new well where the drillers got to a depth of 8,000 feet and something went wrong with the casing near the surface. And at an extremely high pressure, the well began to blow out. There were two major cracks at the surface from which the muds and gases flew up into the air and ooze came out of the road cuts and ran down the county road. It took 57 hours to get under control. Now this was adjacent to a housing development and it was not surprising to hear that the people living in the area had to be evacuated using respirators and stay away from their homes for days because of the noxious fumes. Every well is going to uh, release volatile hydrocarbons, volatile organic compounds. Some of them are polycyclical aromatic hydrocarbons. And all of them other than methane, methane's pretty simple, not particularly toxic itself, but all the ones that are higher, more carbon atoms than that, have some type of health risk. I'm concerned about known carcinogens, such as benzene, um, not only in the water, but in the air. That can cause anything from leukemia to catastrophic bone marrow failure, aplastic anemia. These are things that kill people. In the counties where activities are concentrated, the cumulative NOx emissions from shale gas activities were on the order of 20 to 40 times higher than what would be allowable for a single minor source. I work for EPA, so I'll talk about it from EPA's point of view. We're incredibly slow. We're abysmally slow at keeping up with any kind of science on risk. You know, it takes us not only a long time, but it takes the consensus of the science to reach. So we have developed through all this time five criteria pollutants. Just five. The industry is using some hundred different chemicals that it's releasing. And so there's no ambient concentration limit for these, for these chemicals. There are toxicity values for some of the air, or some of the chemicals as they move into the air that are unknown right now. They don't know what the toxic value is. The CDPHE, the, your state government, when it looks at it says, I can see it's doesn't look like a risk because we're not over these criteria pollutants of ozone, particulate 
particulate matter, NOx, SOx, and VOCs. Dr. Colburn looks at the same information, the very same uh, concentrations, and she goes to the science, which your government doesn't do, and she says it's risky. I believe her. Southern Methodist University study looking at Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas area, looking at air pollution, something that's not gotten a lot of attention. The, uh, if you look at a drilling site, you'll see it glutted with not only the diesel trucks and diesel equipment, but compressors and separators. And this is a major source of air pollution, the, the pollution that causes ozone. And it found in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, one of the largest metro areas in the United States, the emissions from oil and gas drilling actually exceeded motor vehicles. It is well documented that daily exposure to ozone leads to early aging of the lungs. They become brittle and dry out. The lungs cannot repair this kind of damage. It is a rare day in the West anymore when we can take a picture without a blue haze destroying the vistas. Here you see the high country where gas development is encroaching on our beautiful forests and mountain meadows. Colorado Public Health Study also looked at that state and found the oil and gas industry and their air emissions exceeded those of motor vehicles in the entire state of Colorado. Two years ago, Pinedale in the Jackson Hole area hit 155 parts per billion. At that time, they had to shut down the ski areas and actually close the schools and not let children go outside in that area. That was twice, more than twice, the compliance level that EPA has established for ozone. Wyoming, a place where there's more prairie dogs than people, probably, literally, that, that Wyoming exceeded federal clean air standards of ozone for the first time in its history and regulators, regulators pointed to the oil and gas industry. We're surrounded by 14 wells within two miles. Uh, within a thousand feet, there's six of them. And I've had the rashes, the nose bleeds, my tongue's bled shortly after the fracking process was done on those wells. Rent here is like, you know, $2,000. You can't find housing, thousands of people living in campers. I can't get in anywhere right now. Get out. Out. You can't even afford to live here if you don't work in the oil field. Walmart is hell. You just don't want to go there. You can't find anything you're looking for because it's all cleared out. It's just frustrating. The truck traffic's insane. It's not if I get in a wreck, it's when. The level of sincerity and politeness has left. We have an insane guy-to-girl ratio. You can't go anywhere without feeling like a piece of meat. Every bar you go to has fights. Shootings, stabbings outside the bar. It used to be so nice here. The largest impact on health in this area is, is, is sexually transmitted diseases. And lots of trucks. I have to say, the days of having a nice conversation sitting out in front of the diner are long gone. Main Street's noisier and louder now than ever. Lots more trucks. The gas company flares wells after they get done fracking them. And from what I understand, it's to burn off any impurities to lower the pressure from underneath. The mobile home park are pretty well filled now. All those empty spaces we had last year now have the mobile home on them. Right behind me, you can see and hear two flaring gas wells. You can hear how loud it is. It sounds like a jet engine. We have had one of our worst odor and fume experiences from a well that's more than a mile behind us here. It was overpowering. We, we have to keep our house closed up as close to airtight as we can day and night every day. But how long generally do these flares last? About a week. And it's 24 hours a day? 24 hours a day, seven, yeah. Is it like a gravel pit and ugly and nasty and noisy and dirty? The answer is yes, it is. Is it desirable to live right next to it? No, it's not.
The impacts are a real challenge to all the oil producing counties. Housing shortages, water demands, constant truck traffic, dust and public safety top the list of their concerns. We know for sure that the emergency room injuries and trauma related to the industry have certainly spiked and that data is available for review. Um, motor vehicle accidents related to the industry have spiked. Failing bridges, like this little bridge, the Baker Bridge, is an example of how intensive industrial traffic can cause maintenance and safety issues because of the daily pounding of hundreds of service trucks. There's been a number of house fires of officially inexplainable origin. Although they have been close to drilling, compressing, or transporting pipeline. Let's be honest, would you want to raise children here? Would you want to live here? No, you wouldn't. So they have absolutely, uh, everything that I've invested in to a property, which is really my retirement fund, is gone. We did a study in reference to what happens to energy development uh, and the property values around them, and they do diminish. We've seen over a 50% devaluation in the value of our land. I don't think there could possibly be a bigger thing facing Colorado Springs. We're about to lose re, uh, realty value. We're going to lose people coming here and hence wanting to stay here. City planners may as well just move. There's nothing left to plan. I'm leaving and others aren't coming. It's the highest regulated industry in one of the highest regulating states. You've been told over the past few months that you can trust the oil and gas industry to police itself, <coughs> that current regulations are sufficient, and that the state of Colorado will protect us. We've done a cost-benefit analysis. We have a whole series of rules on well bore integrity. We have an existing body of rules that we believe protects groundwater. We believe we have the data and evidence to back up the fact that drilling oil and gas wells does not cause systemic impacts to, to bedrock aquifers. I think it's kind of ridiculous. You go one year, three years, and six years, a lot can happen in that time. And I think if something does happen, you want to fix it as soon as possible and not have two years or three years pass. We've done a cost-benefit analysis. How can the oil and gas industry be well regulated when they are exempt from the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Safe Drinking Water Act. It is a safe process. If it wasn't a safe process, the EPA would have real regulations that would stop it. The Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission has set out a, a, a list of very reasonable regulations that we've operated on statewide that have been very good and fair and they have protected our environment. There have been a thousand documented spills in the state of Colorado in 30 months, nearly one per day. 42% of those spills have had documented groundwater contamination. Does that sound like the state of Colorado is protecting us? I don't think so. I find this enlightening and actually frustrating. 19,000 wells in Colorado and our state commission doesn't even think it's important to know where the injection wells are. We've done a cost benefit analysis. The COGCC has failed to prevent or mitigate adverse environmental and human health impacts in accordance with their mission statement, and they should be held accountable on all measures. We don't hold the oil and gas um, to a standard that they need to explain to us what they're going to do with that water. I feel very strongly we are protecting our citizens. There's no doubt in my mind. As of August 7th, we had 48,192 active wells in the state of Colorado and 13, that's one three, inspectors. Our expectations are very low of the oil and gas uh, uh, community when our uh, natural resources, particularly in the state of Colorado and particularly water, is one of the most important resources that we have. The proposal for the regulations in front of you this afternoon do show that oil and gas drilling would be a permitted use within all zone districts. I still am having a problem with why we don't restrict it to agricultural and, and maybe an industrial zone. Selling a car is a lot less intrusive than, you know, drilling. And yet, Drilling is a principally permitted use in a residential zone under this ordinance. I just really have a hard time wrapping my arms around that. I couldn't put a shed back there to put my mother-in-law in if I wanted to. 
please don't tell her I said that. Um, <laughs> but if my lot was big enough, I could put an oil well back there. It just doesn't make sense. Fracking in any kind of um, residential area or within town limits is probably not a great idea. Here's the playground. Here's an active oil and gas production area. Here's the elementary school. And here is another oil and gas well. So Religious institutions conditional with the development permit. Schools uh, conditional. Um, and yet we're theoretically would allow drilling in every residential zone. person asked, well, what would happen if somebody put an oil well in your backyard? Congressman Polis said, I would move. Even if I wanted to build a house on a residential lot, you can still restrict what I can do there. You make me follow the building codes. Right. You say I have to have certain setbacks. I can't be at over a certain height, et cetera, et cetera. So you still restrict. And in some cases, you prohibit what I can do on that. So if you can prohibit what I can do and, re and take away some of my private property rights, I don't understand why the same rationale doesn't apply to private e minerals. Exactly. Rights. Am I, am I e yeah, 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 exactly. And I you feel know, like you, we're. You restrict my ability to exercise my private property rights, and we do that all the time through land use regulations. I don't understand why mineral rights here sometimes get a pass that I don't get on the surface. The state controls are there now, whether you like it or not. There is room for land use regulation as long as it doesn't operationally conflict with those state rules and regulations. Whenever a municipality has restricted where, where oil and gas can be permitted at, it has resulted in, in litigation. We restrict mining to agriculturally zoned areas only, so how is that not a taking if I can't mine coal underneath my property in a residential area? Why is, that, why is that okay to prohibit but not oil and gas in a residential area? Sure, Good question. And I, I don't know. The owner of those mineral rights has not only the right to extract the minerals and obtain that value, they have a legal right to use the surface, your surface. Major considerations as we move forward with this discussion, uh, avoid operational conflicts. Essentially avoiding the conflicts between municipal ordinances and the areas of law established by the state. Is this based on threats from this uh, state, the Attorney General, the uh, COGCC, uh, the Governor's Office, or is this based on statutory law and case law? In order to avoid conflict with a state, you do not have to make oil and gas operations a, a permitted use in every single zone and part of the state. Mr. Lockhart refers to numerous court cases and court decisions which show that the Colorado, the COGCC, and the state attorney general are overstepping their authority. I have a hard time voting for something that says, well, we have to allow it everywhere because the state says we have to. I just, it just seems to go in the face of where we are as a home rule city. Avoid operational conflicts. You know what? We're going to stand up to you, state. You're not watching out for us. Other cities have done it. I don't care if the state sues us. That shouldn't be our priority because they're not doing a very good job regulating this industry. We believe that, that it lies within the purview of, of a municipality to try, or a county to protect its citizens. Avoid operational conflicts. The city should have the right to determine what their city looks like. They're poisoning our drinking water, and the, e and the EPA said, you know what, you no longer have to comply with EPA standards what? for stuff you put into the water. Why? So the greedy oil and gas company said, great, what? let's go crazy. And my guest is Oscar-winning actress Julie Andrews. I'll ask if the hills are still alive after all that fracking. Places that people have gone and fished for years, they're not finding fish anymore. These wells are leaking. This is gonna ruin the groundwater. We have much more abundant resources of gas than we had ever fathomed. We've gotten to the point where in our desperate need for hydrocarbons, we actually, by definition, inject poisons into the earth. Let us compete and we can rebuild, we can do it safely, and we can keep America moving, and we can be the bridge to the future. The emissions that come out of that are carcinogens, and I don't want to get cancer again. I won't say the gas company will lie to you, but I'll tell you they withhold information. I could not move into an industrial zone as a residential person, so why should an industrial place be able to move into where people live? At Chevron, if we can't do it right, we won't do it at all. The return on investment of paying off a politician, running an ad, discrediting critics is it's it's one of the best investments that the industry can make an energy plan that will 
take advantage of all the resources God has blessed us with, natural gas, coal, oil, alternative energy, increase them to make our supply of energy plentiful and the job opportunities massive. We've got to think long term. It's interesting stuff, but I don't know how it really protects our citizens. There's nothing to really hang our hat on that we can assure our community that this is safe. Uh, you, you would think that, as Council Member uh, Martin said, that the company, the industry, would be more than willing to do whatever it takes to prove that uh, they're in compliance and not polluting. Would you live next door to one? If oil is $250 a barrel, they're going to want to drill there no matter what. I'm very interested in the economic benefit, but I also have grandchildren. I'm very interested in protecting the environment for them. I feel comfortable that I could actually vote for this because the facts are the facts and science is science. I don't know about you guys but I hate it when my kids get cancer. What you are gambling with and wanting to put in our town is something that will eventually break down and endanger the health of our precious community. Just hearing that we can do something like this tears me apart. I didn't come to this town to expose my child to cancer. I believe that if you let fracking go through, then it will drive away youth from the city. I don't think any job is worth my help. Please do as we've all requested and take our children's future in your hands and protect all of your citizens. Thank you. You cannot drink or breathe a dollar bill. I'm beginning to think that the new brute force hydraulic fracturing cannot be done safely. There are too many liabilities and too many risks. And this is just completely wrong. It's toxic, it's stupid. Why should I conserve water? Why should I zero escape if these people are going to come in and use our clean water? We don't allow any other industry to back up to a hole in the ground and pour toxic chemicals into it. So why would we allow an industry like this one to do just that? It is going to be toxic to our environment. I've been practicing environmental law for 30 years here in Colorado, and I'm very concerned about leaving our kids with a clean, safe environment. I would just like to know how anybody can consider natural gas a more important resource than pure drinking water. Don't do it. I wouldn't want it where my kids are growing up. Communities like ours should be able to stand up and say, we don't want this in our communities without the threat of the state coming into suit. This is our home. They need not to take the word of the fracking industry that they need to do their own research. The rules that are on the books now are strong. They're going to be enforced. We're going to trust these folks that they're going to do the right thing. Let's verify and then we'll trust. We need these jobs. We need this. Are, are, what are you going to do or what is anybody going to do to say, oh, we don't need this energy right now? You're going to turn the heat off in your home? Jack and I drove here in cars. You're going to not have to use gas anymore? The idea that this can be done safely and without impact uh, I think that we could disprove that real quickly if you've come and, and see us here at Pavilion, Wyoming. And this last news that we just reported in the last few days, Environmental Protection Agency agreeing to begin delivering fresh water to four homes in northeastern Pennsylvania where water wells have been contaminated by fracking. Welcome to the industrial waste zone. Oh, by the way, coming to a neighborhood near you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're screwed. Oh.